white powder on the ceiling at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you can see it's clumping up on itself because it's rather fine. Um, and this is what we will be oxidizing. This has an alcohol group, which we will be turning into a ketone group. So this is going to go into our 10 ml carbon glass. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is going to be dissolved in ethyl acetate, which you can see right here. We measure out one milliliter of this, and this is purely acting as the solvent in the reaction. It's not involved in the mechanism. Close enough. Liter of ethyl acetate. Good. I'm going to go ahead and get this stirring just to let that ordeal dissolve. Now, whenever you're stirring in a lab class like this, try to get it as high up and as powerful of a stir as you can without splashing up on the sides. Uh, you're going to get better yields this way, things are going to move faster for you. Uh, in order to get the smoothest stirring, you should also put your stir bar dead center on the stir plate and get it down as low as possible. Hopefully that will help you throughout the rest of your labs. Uh, okay, so this quickly dissolved in. It's already done. Uh, so now I'm going to go ahead and add my oxidizing agent. Uh, and our oxidizing agent today is OXO, which is a granular salt uh, white powder. Uh, Oxo is a trade name of a pretty complex little molecule, uh, but the active ingredient in it is potassium peroxymonosulfate. Uh, that is going to act as the oxidizing agent, uh, which will allow us to get our ketone. Uh, I'm going to add that in really quick. Stirring this. This is not on heat at all. 
So any carbon footprint associated with heating the reaction uh, does not apply. Um, we're also using sodium chloride uh, as a catalyst. Now aside from catalysts being regenerated throughout the mechanism being used multiple times, which is great, uh, sodium chloride is very readily abundant um, and easily get a hold of. Um, on top of that, uh, morneol can be extracted from a multitude of natural sources. Um, so that's uh, again provides you many routes to get the starting materials on. And overall, this is way better than the alternative, which is chromium-based oxidation reactions. And chromium is horrible for the environment. And so by skipping that, we are uh, eliminating a toxic waste stream. Okay, with that being said, uh, that's the first part of the lab. I've got 50 minutes in which I'm going to set up my test to see if the oxidation is complete, as well as a few other things that will allow me to isolate the Borneo that we produce now. Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, so we have let the reaction run for 50 minutes. Uh, after that time, we added another small addition of sodium chloride just to uh, make sure that the reaction ran to and here's what the reaction looks like right now. Let's see if I can get the focus to come here. Uh, there we go. So we have a clear layer on top and a cloudy layer on the bottom. And the cloudy layer is our aqueous layer containing all of that water. Um, so the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to perform a test to see if all of our oxidant has been up all of our uh, oxone that is on um, and we're going to do that with potassium iodide so this is just a test tube with a very tiny amount of potassium iodide in it and I'm going to use acetic acid to partially dissolve that and get the reaction going or uh, not quite yet but just to provide a solvent for it so just a few drops of acetic acid. Okay. So, potassium iodide, the potassium doesn't matter as much in this test as much as the iodide. Um, I negative, the iodide uh, anion, that is yellow color. Uh, which you'll see once the reaction hits it. Um, if there is still oxone present, what it's going to do is it's going to oxidize that I negative to I2, which is molecular iodine. And that is dark purple. Um, you can also form I3 negative, uh, which is uh, another form of oxidized iodide, and that is gonna be brown. So let's see what our reaction looks like when we test it with a bit of iodine. So let's see if I can show the color here. There we go. And so I've got just a slight yellow coloration here um, and in your handbook um, for the lab it'll show you what that brown color that we would expect would look like if it was actually not run to completion and there was still some oxone present but it certainly looks like uh, we are done with the reaction and we're not going to need this bisulfite that I have prepared um, okay so, uh, in our uh, organic layer here, uh, we have the product that we're trying to make, that's the Borneo. Um, and so we are going to do an extraction to make sure that we get all of it. Um, and eventually, we are going to dry it of any remaining trace water and get it onto the road back for collection. Uh, so, I'm going to start by getting a stir bar retriever.
So we use these 10 mil round bottom flasks a lot, and they are really tricky to get the stir bar out of. The trick is to actually hold the magnet on the outside of the container and circle around and jostle it until it comes out that way. The whole thing, this whole thing can't actually fit through the center. So there, a little trick for you. So, make sure that my secretory funnel is in the closed position, and I'm just going to go ahead and dump this guy in. And the next thing I'm going to extract with is 5 milliliters of water. run that through my reaction vessel first just to make sure that the contents of that vessel all make it into the secretory funnel. And then we're also going to extract with 8 milliliters of ethyl acetate to provide more of an organic layer than our product can dissolve it. which is formed here. A little bit of a foam layer, but that's quickly breaking up. And hopefully you can see that I've got a nice aqueous layer on the bottom and an organic layer on top. And uh, all of my product is dissolved up here in the ethyl acetate and the organic layer with waste products being down here in the aqueous layer. So, um, I have this container for my aqueous layer.
Alrighty. And that emulsion, that foamy layer in the middle, that broke up a lot faster this time because it's the product that actually forms that. Okay, aqueous layer back out, that comes out first. And when I'm extracting this aqueous layer right now, I'm gonna let just a drop of the organic layer through as well. And there's a reason for that. Uh, I do not want a single drop of water in this organic layer. The next couple of steps we're gonna do is all about drying the organic layer and getting the water out. So I'm gonna sacrifice a drop of organic layer right now just to make sure I don't introduce any water. sodium chloride solution. This is so concentrated that it will suck water out of the organic layer and into the water layer. tricky one but we can see it so we can extract and I'm just gonna let the brine fall into this aqueous layer again and I'm gonna do the exact same thing again where I'm gonna let a little bit of the organic layer through just a drop or two just to make sure I don't get any water in the organic layer um, and yeah, I am just going to use this flask again. Um, the sodium sulfate should be. Can I get the flask, please? We just spent a few minutes uh, drying this with brine. I don't want to put it back in this. step that we're going to use uh, before rotavapping is sodium sulfate. Now, this might be a review for several of you, but sodium sulfate uh, comes in a jar like this, and it's got this very fine crystal grain structure. When it's introduced to water, it clumps up on itself and it sticks to the glass in itself. Uh, just to make transferring easier, I got a little weight paper. And now I can fold this 
this up like a taco. And I'm going to start with just enough sodium sulfate to uh, cover the bottom of the container. And swirl. Now, sodium sulfate, I like to look at the bottom of the container because I can see what's stuck. And this stuff that got stuck to the glass, that found some water. That found some water and it reacted with it and it's taken it out of the organic layer. This stuff floating around that moves freely along the bottom of the glass, that's pretty good. That's still stuck to itself though. So it's still finding minimal amount of water. I'm gonna keep adding sodium sulfate until the new stuff that I add in finds no water to react with and doesn't get clumpy at all. And giving it a good swirl, always a good idea, just to expose all of the solution to the drying agent. All right, and now I have a significant amount of sodium sulfate which is freely moving around the bottom of the container. And kind of difficult to see, but I do have tiny grains that have not changed since I uh, took them out of this container. And so those tiny grains have not found any water to react with. And so we're gonna move on. And uh, Rotovap is now waterless solution. If you're ever unsure about your sodium sulfate though, let it sit for five minutes. Even if you've undershot the amount, um, letting it sit will basically ensure that uh, your solution is dry and it'll go that well. Um, you could use a funnel for this if you don't trust your pouring skills, but if you believe in yourself, you can decant, which means pouring the liquid and leaving the solid. little bit of product left over stuck to my sodium sulfate so I'm gonna hit it with just a little bit of fresh ethyl acetate two mils give it a good swirl when you're rotovapping because you can get rid of this solvent so fast you might as well use a fair amount of solvent to collect your product. You just have to make sure that you're not overfilling the container that you're gonna rotovap with. We definitely wanna keep them about one third full, definitely no more than one half. Okay, all of the products and solvent that I can collect is in here. I'm going to go rotovap the solution. So, our flask is going to go on and I'm going to hold it on there until I can get this blue Keck clamp to fix it onto the rotovap. Um, first we roto, then we vap. So we're going to rotate. We usually keep this somewhere around 150 rotations per minute. Um, I'm going to bring it down into the warm bath and then I'm going to kick on my vacuum. And I can hear my kill switch is still open up here, so I'm going to close this air vent and let the vacuum actually start to build up. And so you can see that the vapors are collecting up here in the condenser. got a little line of solid that's appearing up here and that's going to continue to grow on the side of the container as we lose our solvent volume.
righty. So, here you can see I've got solid just plastered all the way inside of my uh, rotovat vessel here. Um, when I see this, it's probably completely dry. I like to let it go another 15 seconds past this uh, just so I have a sample that I can hopefully take a melting point of. But you can also see that up here, um, we're done collecting vapors. There's no more dripping. Okay, I feel done. So, we'll kill the spin, lift it out of the warm bath, and then I'm gonna kill my vacuum. And this whole thing is still in your vacuum, so I can't take this off. I'm gonna slowly open this up and just leak in air. And I like to leak this in because if you have a fluffy powder in here, as you do sometimes, if you just blast this whole system with air by opening this up really quickly, uh, it'll kick that powder up into this bump trap here. All right. And ta-da. And we've got dry crystalline material uh, plastered on the inside of the container here. 